Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest in the series of Academy of Urbanism uh, lunch hours. Um, uh, good afternoon to those of you who are on British summertime. Um, for those of you elsewhere, uh, you're, you're particularly welcome uh, at whatever the time of day it is where you are. Um, the topic today is the is the way in which um, our historic places and our appreciation of them might help to uh, help help us help to pull us out of uh, the circumstances that we are we are in at the moment in a more constructive uh, and hopefully socially responsible responsible way. Um, one of the uh, one of the uh, adverts for this session talked about. Um, heritage-led regeneration um, and I think many of us feel that actually leading, her leading re regeneration by any particular um, means is uh, unlikely to be entirely successful but certainly our historic environment is one of the components of, of our towns and cities that can contribute to and support uh, re regeneration um, in, in all its forms. And we've got two speakers today who have particular experience from different perspectives uh, are in that in that context. Um, I, I wanted to start briefly by saying that I think it's particularly important uh, to look at uh, our historic places at a time like this because there's an increasing emphasis um, not just on social distancing but on local solutions to the way in which we might pull ourselves out of this crisis um, and indeed the, the climate uh, and other economic crises that, that various communities are facing to various extents around the world. So it's a, a pertinent uh, area for, for discussion. Um, my background, um, if you don't know, uh, is as a planner and urban designer with a particular emphasis uh, over the last decade or so on the way in which um, our built heritage uh, relates to the wider the wider built environment uh, and that's what I do as a as a as a consultant uh, for most of the time. I'm the past chairman of the Academy of Urbanism uh, and currently chairman of the Historic Towns and Villages Forum um, and so with that background I'm particularly pleased to welcome uh, Shane Quinn from from Belfast the uh, the development manager of the Belfast Buildings Trust uh, with whom I spent a very interesting day uh, a year or so ago uh, exploring uh, parts of the centre of, uh, of Belfast uh, and also Nick Taylor, uh, the former commercial director for the Peace Hall in Halifax. Um, if you haven't been to the Peace Hall it is uh, a remarkable singular uh, building with a singular history um, within that remarkable uh, remarkable city and I think it's particularly useful that um, that Shane is going to talk from a community and cultural perspective um, and Nick's background um, is, in, uh, is in commerce, in tourism uh, and leisure management. Uh, so I think their, their different perspectives will give us uh, a very useful insight into the way in which uh, historic places can not only respond to the circumstances that, uh, that we're facing uh, but also help to, to pull us through and out into a more a more constructive and optimistic future. Um, the, the advertisement for today uh, suggested that this was an hour and a half. Um, it's actually a one hour session, so I hope that you will be able to stay uh, focused for, for, that, uh, for that time. Um, can I also, I'm trying to change the slide. Um, can you change it for me, Stephen? I don't think so, Steve. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, well, uh, can I just, uh, if, I'm not able to change the slide, but if, um, oh, I can, here we go. Um, can I just let you know that, that we will be recording this, um, this lunch hour uh, session. So um, if you don't want to be, um, to be recorded on it, if you could uh, hide your face um, uh, by muting your, your video, then you will remain incognito. Um, and I also remind you that the chat bar is there for you to uh, to comment and ask questions and as we go through the two presentations we will 
uh, knowledge of that uh, and pick up questions uh, and ideas that you want to put forward and we will put those to the to the two speakers as we go through the discussion after their presentations. Um, if you've got better um, multi multitasking skills than I have, then you may want to tweet uh, and uh, using this using this hashtag, uh, we're always pleased to encourage greater uh, greater awareness of what we're doing. And if I can just flag up the the, the next one, uh, the ne the next event. Uh, is a lunchtime event on the 23rd of July, sponsored by, by JTP, looking at the, uh, the ways in which we can um, maintain the, uh, the interest in uh, development, in, in community engagement, uh, beyond the initial, uh, the initial excitement of, um, of, of involvement. Um, and uh, subsequent to that, um, on the 24th of July, we have building a new sustainable town to the south of, um, of Southampton on the Solent uh, with Aldred Drummond, the chief executive of, of the new Forty Waterside project and, and Atoll Noon, who's the director of, uh, of Marketees Associates. So um, having said that, um, I've mentioned the, the two speakers that we have today. They're going to speak each for around 10 minutes um, and uh, if you can hold your your questions until after uh, after Nick has spoken, um, then we will try and make sure that we manage the subsequent discussion in a way that's uh, that's as uh, as constructive and as positive as possible. Okay, so having said that, um, let me uh, stop sharing this screen and and hand over to uh, to Shane Quinn uh, from the Bil Belfast Buildings Trust. Shane. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much uh, to everyone for the opportunity, for the invitation to, to speak and for the opportunity to, to do so today. Um, uh, very quickly, can, hopefully that is working okay and everyone can see okay. Um, uh, so it was very quickly, uh, I wanted to just say, I'm, uh, as you've already introduced, Steve, I'm Development Manager at Belfast Buildings Trust, and just in terms of the context of the trust, um, it's a but it's a little charity in Belfast. Um, has been on the go, as it were, for close to twenty five years. It was established in nineteen eighty six to deliver physical, social, economic regeneration through the reuse of Belfast historic buildings, and that was one of the first uh, buildings that we did now: um, school and library for a city centre. Uh, sorry, library and IT suite for a city centre school. I suppose it's important to say there's no template in terms of how the trust goes about its work. It, 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 it's very much about working with people um, and um, looking at finding long-term solutions that meet a community need, uh, whether that is uh, in the cultural, social, economic sphere. Um, it's about a process of, of engaging, and that's one of um, probably our, 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 certainly our biggest project and our, our current ongoing one at Carlisle Memorial Church in North Belfast. One of the projects um, that the Trust recently launched is something called Successful Belfast. And when I say recently, actually, it's probably about three years ago now, um, but it still feels very recent. And that was the idea of trying to find ways of engaging uh, and involving more people from different backgrounds in the city's future development uh, and trying to tell a story of the city as a place that thinks and does differently. So it's about using that cultural heritage um, to kind of say, this is how we need to involve more people in the city's future, um, as it were. And I wanted to start off, I think important to kind of frame the notion of, uh, as you were highlighting in your introduction about what kind of recovery uh, am I talking about in terms of all of this? And I, it's the notion that lockdown um, prompted lots of reflections of a new normal. And um, we all had lots of time. We all were out cycling on our bikes. Those of us who hadn't done it for 20 years, um, we were all shopping at the local um, butcher and, and baker and, and candlestick maker. And all of that is lovely in the short term, but wishing a new normal does not make it so. Um, and I suppose the reflection on that for me is that it took until the 7th of July for a support package for arts and culture and heritage um, to, to be announced, all of which is welcome. But I think to my mind that reflects a perception that these are additional elements of the economy that arts and culture and heritage 
aren't kind of core parts of business in the same way that office is in, in, in a sense. But I think it also reflects a lack of coherent and resourced voices to articulate the importance of these things, uh, unlike pubs. Uh, and it's also important, I suppose, to ask the question of what kind of heritage or what is heritage rather. Um, uh, and I guess it's about for me saying that often heritage is seen as rules and restrictions and regulations, but actually heritage is about opportunity. It's about openness and it's about something that's ongoing. Heritage is, I mean, it's the cliche heritage is seen as being something about the past, but heritage is now and heritage is about using what has gone before to inform what comes next in a sense. None of this is earth shattering uh, and other people are, are talking about lots of similar things. I happened to see this morning, even just the RSA has uh, released something around what new work is going to be about. And that's talking about being more agile and flexible and focused on people and, and enhanced well-being. So all of this for me comes to a point of simply repackaging and articulating what I believe heritage offers as a way to lead that more humane recovery. Um, because heritage underpins our places because it underpins us. Um, if places are about people, then places must be about heritage as well. And that is a mix of the tangible and the intangible. It's yes, it's buildings, yes, it's music, it's nature, it's myths, it's literature as this reflects um, the, the statue of Aslan um, representing C.S. Lewis at C.S. Lewis Square on the Conswater Greenway. And what we would talk about over here is crack. All of that is part of heritage. Um, and it's that notion of what makes something real for me is rooted in the heritage. Three words that I use most when it kind of comes to, to work are authentic and, and relevant and confident in the role that heritage has. And it's the notion that heritage makes what's authentic the basis of what we do next. Um, and that comes, I know that also sounds a bit like a cliche, but I sit on the Northern Ireland Heritage Stakeholder Forum and I particularly sit on the Marcoms group for that. Um, and lots of the conversations come around that too often and for too long, the gap isn't about people recognizing what's authentic. It's about making heritage relevant beyond that perception of those who get it. But I would argue that people get it, the general public get it um, in a way that we sometimes don't often give them credit because they know when there's somewhere that uses its past um, and they know when there's somewhere that, that doesn't. And if you all indulge me for one minute, I wanna show you a quick video that was produced by the Northern Ireland Tourist Board. So bear with me for 60 seconds. So that was a video, as I said, that was produced by the Northern Ireland Tourist Board about two years ago, um, following a call for local people, for people from Northern Ireland to um, crowdsource material, footage, whatever, in terms of how people from here would want to advertise here to people from outside of Northern Ireland. And my point for showing that, I guess, is that local people recognize 
the importance of how heritage underpins the place that Northern Ireland is in a broad sense. And that mix of tangible and intangible. We had lighthouses, we had cathedrals, we had dancing, we had rivers, we had music. So that's my point that people get how important heritage is. So I would argue that we need to close the gap by being more explicit about the relevance of heritage to the future of our places and the opportunity that it presents to that more balanced, human-centered, humane recovery. And I guess the question then of how, um, and first of all, it's about realizing that a heritage-led recovery is a people-led recovery. It's the notion of that our cities, our towns, our urban places can have light manufacturing in there, that it's about more ground floor, small scale use. It's about more focus on the local and the neighborhoods, as, as you mentioned, Steve, in your introduction. It's about the idea of social public space, about mixed demographics and mixed housing, the creation of green space, uh, the notion of greater mass culture that respects and reflects the historic and heritage at mass culture, like theater and debating salons, all of that stuff, and equally rethinking our office environments. And I want to be clear that I'm not arguing or, or, or kind of advocating for a return to a perfect time, but simply a recognition that a more human environment is part of the heritage of when our urban centers worked. And I say worked in inverted commas. There's, there's been a lot of discussion and debate in recent years about how particularly retail offering and our urban cores have been struggling. And there's the notion, the Republic of Ireland, uh, the new government has a new town centre's first policy. So all of that for me is very much rooted in how heritage is part of the solution for a, a, a heritage-led recovery. The second how is, I guess, accepting that balanced growth is better growth. Um, the economic premise of lots of recent announcements has been about saving jobs, which I absolutely understand. I understand the, the, the requirement for all of that, and I'm not arguing against it. I'm simply saying that a heritage-led recovery gives us the opportunity to focus on the jobs and the skills and the economy of the future. Um, there's huge economic trauma coming. We, we know that um, uh, with predictions of 4 million jobless potentially by the end of the year. And somewhere like in a Belfast context, the former Cronin Road Courthouse um, in a very deprived bit of inner city Belfast, um, which has sat derelict 25 years, suffered a series of fires. Um, if we think over the long term about potentially a skills um, focus redevelopment with young people that focuses on green jobs and even the whole cultural shift around how we reuse existing building stock um, and the impact that that has on climate change and urban density and all of that. That for me is how heritage can equally add to uh, 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 the, the recovery bit. And the final bit, I'm conscious of time and I'm going to stop rambling very quickly, um, is around the, again, very much influenced by the Belfast context, um, but I think applicable anywhere is about how heritage is about our personal, it's our self identity as well as place identity. One of the projects that the, the trust did a few years ago was about the creation of an opera um, in Carlisle Memorial Church, it was uh, used Carlisle Memorial Church as the centerpiece for this performance of an opera that was created from stories of people to tell a story of the city. And one that we're working on at the moment is a podcast series to tell the stories of people who are often forgotten, um, but who have all played an important role in the city in some form and the buildings that are connected with them that people often overlook. So it's about understanding there are multiple identities of self and place, and that's what drives distinctive places, unspooling all of that and, and figuring out what is it that heritage can help 
us figure out in terms of our own identity and the, the, the multiple identities of place is what will create distinct or help us create distinctive places. And I just want to finish, you can't have a, a, a presentation on urbanism uh, without a quote from Jane Jacobs. Um, and I suppose that's my view in terms of how heritage is about using the imagination um, and, and helping us use imagination of how we help the recovery of our cities and towns. And that's it from me. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. Um, uh, well, we're, we're getting comments coming in already, but I will I'll keep our, uh, our discussion until after, after we've heard from, from Nick. But I'm particularly interested in exploring this idea of how, how we might use, use people's own recognition of their uh, of their heritage rather than trying to impose uh, impose a, a, an academic definition on on them um, but let's move on to to uh, to Nick Taylor now whose uh, whose background uh, in the time that I've known him has been primarily in related to the, the the remarkable improvements that have been achieved in Scarborough but more recently he's been uh, very actively involved in the reimagining of uh, of the Peace Hall uh, a remarkable singular building in, in Halifax. Over, over to you, Nick. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, it's, it's lovely to, to get the opportunity of talking today because whilst it's very interesting to look at how a city works, we, we, we had this one single site in, in the middle of a, a West Yorkshire town that was just crying out for some some effort to be made to it. So if I start sharing the screen, uh, you'll see the, there we go, uh, just one moment, please. There we go. That was the Peace Hall as it was uh, on its opening day or shortly after in 1779. So to put this into some context, if I may, um, really this place has been used by vast numbers of people. I mean, social distancing isn't going on there very much, but um, in opening in 1779, to great accolades, it, what it was, it was a, it was a cloth hall. It was, one of the, it was one of several cloth halls built in the north of the country um, and is the last remaining one um, and is the most remarkable building. Um, as you can see all the way around, there are small pods and the whole idea of those was, that just to again, let you know what the background of this super site was, that it was, you would go out, the merchants went all the way around, around the region, collecting or buying pieces of cloth and a piece of cloth is 30 yards long by the width of your loom. Um, and this cloth was all collected and brought to this one site and traded over a two hour period each morning on a Saturday morning. Uh, so that's all it did. But the rest of the time it was a community operated building and it must, made, must have made a massive difference to them in, in the area. The gentleman behind it was called Cagill, and uh, he was in the time of Anne Lister, if ever you were watching the, the TV programme, that sort of era we're talking about. Um, and he must have been on, like her, she did on a grand tour, he must have gone to Mar to Venice and seen the Plaza San Marco or to Sierra to Siena to see the del Piazza del Compo. And maybe those sort of places stimulated saying, well, I've one of them in Halifax. Um, and here we are, it uh, was a rather splendid sight. But it's the last remaining cloth hall. And um, it, it, until 1867, it traded very successfully, but by then the Industrial Revolution had taken over and the, um, the next site, well, the next thing to take over in that site was a wholesale market for fish and fruit and vegetables. And it lasted until about uh, the, into the 1970s. And in the 1970s, it went to one vote whether to maintain this wholesale market or to demolish it and make it into a car park. I'm delighted they made it into a, a market. They made it, they cleared all the internal buildings out and created this great space. It was then used as a market space. So throughout the time we, uh, they were operating it, it they were daily markets, but all the reunions around the outside were things like uh, museums and art galleries. And it worked quite well, but the council really needed to move on and move it out of their control. And then like lo lots of many local authorities, this more, collective idea of starting to make the community think differently about its place and differently very much about its heritage and uh, bringing that heritage to be used very constructively and this is the an idea of what the place well this is how it looks now um, we don't tend to have markets of the nature that were being shown there in the previous one uh, but this in the previous slide but now we have a, a very different type of uh, of clean 
beautifully designed place. It was designed by a magnificent architect called Mark Hopton, Mark Hopton of LDN Architects. Um, and if anybody knows him, he, they know I'm a big fan. The, the piece of work he did here to create a level operating space really was quite remarkable. And the actual area now, you bear in mind that if you look at the north wall on the far end there, it, the slope is over one story. Um, and they managed to make a big flat space in the center for us to hold events on and such likes. And it really made such a difference. Previously in the past, uh, up until the, this, uh, this change, it had all been on a fairly large slope with a couple of flat areas. When they wanted to do anything, they had to deck it out. That doesn't have to happen now. And also there's been introduction of water, which makes such a difference to the site. It's quite faux actually, is having the, that water there. It, it, it's nothing, there was no stream running through the site previously, but the difference it makes for children to play in is, is quite remarkable. Um, the human scale, I think, of the site is also something that's particularly important. It makes the people who are there feel very safe. Uh, it's quiet, there's a complete lack of traffic. And this, you know, would obviously de it's much easier when you're just dealing with one building. But the influence this has brought to the area has been remarkable. Again, we've already seen uh, Leeds Beckett University acquire a building next door. Uh, there have been restaurants and, and bars open in the area. And it's only going to be a matter of time before some of the empty mills around that area start to really have, start to redevelop and change. And it's bringing that sense of change and that heritage change to the town and to that area of the town that's so important. We're lucky, we've got a railway station slap across the road, and it means that when we want to bring large numbers of people into the site, we're very easily able to. One of the areas that also was, was very innovative, again, of the LDN architects, was this, the lighting scheme around the place. So after dark, the place does look spectacular, and start influencing that with a few people, and you really start seeing some, some change. So what did we then do to make this place work and um, my, my line my I was brought in as the commercial lead to start managing and curating the space so what we could have done is just let any old business come in but we didn't want to do that we had to be an objective to be at the heart of the community with an objective to employ lots of you know a lot of people setting up their own businesses we employ the, the trust employs about 100 people itself um, and then with all the businesses that have come in we've probably got somewhere in the region of 400 people working actively in the place as I said, it wants to be at the heart of the community, but it's also reaching out to all sorts of different sectors around the place. So my role was to start screening and engaging with local businesses. And that was just a load of, uh, just the most inspiring thing I think I've done for a long, long time. The nature of the shops and the businesses that wanted to come in was spectacular. We wanted it to feel very family-based. Um, you see down the bottom there, that's a, three, a family there. They, that little boy is called George, it's called G's Cakes. Um, and they make the most amazing cakes. And that's Dan Fletcher, the, the gentleman there. He's a play plays for Halifax Rugby League. And I have a big ambition to have him sitting, standing uh, for taking a picture of him in his rugby league outfit, making something like a fairy cake, because he is the size of a normal fridge. He's a super guy. Um, and a typical example of the sort of traders we have there. Um, the picture of just a little slot above that with an amazing artisan jeweler in the building. The most innovative toy shop I think I've ever come across. And, and a wonderful bookshop. But what we had to do is make sure we didn't have any great deals of crossover of businesses there. So we were going for local, we were going to challenge the traditional high street. Um, I'm a great believer in challenging the traditional high street. Um, I've been quite critical of them at time, of times like of people like bids and retailers. Being a hotelier makes you feel this way rather. But we wanted to see an eclectic mix of businesses come in. We wanted to see people in there who aren't traditionally seen on the high street where with a fantastic level of customer care and excellent customer service and that's what we've got and it really started to show the area how to how to move things on and we have also catering was very important uh, we we have a, a bar and bars and restaurants in the place two of which are or three sorry of which are operated by by tenants and we have got also the i say we but the trust has also got a very busy ice cream parlor and a uh, and a delicatessen we also had a challenge in a big space that we wanted to operate. We, I proposed to the board of, the board of trustees, we, uh, we get a 
a, uh, our own restaurant installed and we did I persuaded them that it was a it was the right thing to do and I'm, I'm happy we did um, we had a super an excellent restaurant uh, um, so we were able to employ local people um, we were able to employ uh, lots of local folk in such people such as you know, I wanted to be seen to get some make some reaching out to new groups of people so we made sure we got a couple of uh, refugees former refugees as involved on the on the team and they've been fantastic and such good members of the team and uh, made a, mar a, a remarkable difference. Um, the other area we had on the top floor, sorry, was a, uh, our own conference room. And uh, that was somewhere we needed to use up. It was meant as an office, but we wanted to use it for conferences. And there it is, we do weddings and functions in there, uh, as well as conferences during the week. Again, it's a great space. It's, a, it, it's very much taken to heart with the local community. And here we have the beginning of the Tour de Yorkshire, probably Two one minutes, of the prime eight. areas. Sorry? Two minutes. Two minutes, great, I'm nearly done. Um, and the Tour de Yorkshire brings thousands of people to the place and really makes, again, a big difference to be seen locally in the region as, a, as a, an actual place that, that such big events like this actually start. But at a more basic level, we, uh, we teamed up with uh, Mary Clear from Tobberden, who many of you may have heard of, um, the ed incredible edible team, and Adam Smith of the Real Junk Food Project. And we had a load of fun uh, last, the year before last where we fed 3,000 people, um, but fed by people from very different backgrounds. So we had Tobberden and Mosque there, and we had the British Army there, and a whole range of other people cooking food, which we just gave away. Um, Adam was able to provide it for nothing, and we had, again, a great day of music and, uh, and bringing people together. And again, it just reflects the fact you can use this wonderful heritage business for building, rather, for such interesting stuff. Um, coming towards the end, uh, we've got a, we do lots of large events there. As you can see, that's Embrace playing on the left-hand side there. So, you know, for expensive conference events like this, we make quite a bit of money out of it, have a great time. But then a quieter type of event and one which again reaches out to more people and includes a far more than audiences a thing we do in the winter which is a we have a, a standing display of, of public art and an example there on the right there is david murphy the um, the artist who's uh, created a thing called the blanket which uh, again was uh, very, very well received throughout those few months so finally, the, um, the social distancing thing is something we're having to contend with there. And 500 people at a time now are allowed in the building. There's a one-way system. People can sanitize their hands as often as they wish. Um, but we are limited to that. There are events going on, but it's quite limited. We have got events coming up. And in 20, 2021, we've got, in the summer, we've got likes of uh, the Kaiser Chiefs and the Specials and Manic Street Peaches, to name but several, coming to play in the place. But as well as that, it's the community aspect that's so important and getting large parts of the community there. So really, as a final say, we're here, we're actually quite well set up, I think, for the, uh, for the future with this. It's the best use of a heritage building that you can make. It's the scale, again, when we've inherited was fantastic. But it's, it's how we move it forward now. And I think some good stuff is going to be coming. So do jump online, have a look at what's going on at the Peace Hall in Halifax. It's easy to get to. Um, and uh, it really will hope to see you there sometime. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. It's, it's, it's certainly a, an inspirational, an inspirational place. Um, uh, we've got a, a number of comments coming through uh, already uh, in relation to both Ch what, what Shane and Nick have said. So we'll come on to what, th those in a moment. But if you'll in just indulge me for a moment, I, I wanted to pick up with, with Shane, the point that he was making about uh, allowing uh, the wider the wider population to define what they think by heritage and I wondered whether Shane you think that perhaps sometimes those who uh, are actively involved in promoting historic places may be maybe perhaps trying too hard to assert their um, their, their benefits when um, it may be that people can can be the best advocates uh, quite informally on their own um short answer to that is absolutely yes um I, I, and i know you're going to ask me how uh, and i don't know that i can answer that bit of the question very easily um but i think yes i mean even myself uh, as someone who obviously works in heritage and wants to articulate the benefits of heritage to people i can only do that through my own prism my own experience and and, and the kind of world in which i operate um but other people will have 
a different interpretation of the exact same piece of heritage, whether that's a building or I did notice in some of the comments there, a statue or a book or whatever that is. And I think it's important and maybe this is influenced by a Northern Irish um, perspective and experience. Um, it's important to recognize that other people's interpretation of heritage might make us uncomfortable and that that's a good thing um, because it is that unspooling of the multiplicities of identities and interpretations that gets us to uh, a, a sense of what I, in a Belfast, context talk about as a civic understanding of a story about the city, a story about the place, because otherwise it is just one person's interpretation or a particular group of people's interpretation about all of that, um, if, if that ramble makes sense in any way. <laughs> well, that, no, that's, that, that's very interesting. The idea of uh, promoting a civic understanding is, is particular, particularly within the Northern Ireland context, I, I can imagine quite a quite a challenge, and maybe there is in 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 building up a sense of belonging uh, within the wider community that there may be there may inevitably be some discomfort to be accepted in that um, by individuals and and groups. Um, it was Ke Kevin Murray who raised who, who raised the issue of um, of whose heritage uh, are we talking about in the in the uh, in the chat alongside your presentation he he mentioned um, David Harvey's uh, monument and myth and but of course you've mentioned the recent uh, the, the recent attention that's being given to um, the former empire and our uh, our history of uh, uh, of slavery which uh, also requires us to re uh, rethink and perhaps represent um, the uh, some aspects of our history I wonder if if uh, Kevin, if you wanted to uh, ex expand on the point that you were making. Yes, I mean, I think others are picking it up and, and, it, and it, it was picked up in both presentations. The, 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 my point is that sometimes as urbanists, we can see heritage as a physical thing. It's the, the critical capital that we carry forward into the future city plan or whatever when actually the, the layers of stories uh, behind that are often more complex. And I'm probably, in addition to the monument and myth, I'd, I'd probably refer to the valued work by um, uh, David Olusoga on houses. Some of you have seen it on television, houses in Bristol and Liverpool and places like that, where there are multiple layers over generations in terms of power, wealth, exploitation, murder. It, and what it often means is that um, it isn't just that there are one or two or three sides to a story, there are multiple layers. And I also think that's what makes it exciting. So it's something about the reveal of that. But I do know um, Delhi's point that um, the, sometimes the funding uh, from a heritage organization or a, is about presenting it a certain way. So it's trying to get this beyond the stories and beyond the, the bricks and mortar, even though sometimes the appreciation is of the bricks and mortar. But I, I, and I think that adds to the excitement of it all too. Thanks. Yes, uh, I, I wonder whether Delhi wanted to add to the point uh, that made the, regarding the uh, alternative me mechanisms. Um, I didn't have much to um, to add to that. It, it's it's just um, that uh, if the main mechanisms are you know sort of large you know uh, centrally funded organisations, uh, then we're going to get more of the same. Um, and there needs to be um, something of a sort of menu um, of, uh, you know, different scales of um, funding, um, different scales of, uh, and, 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 and types of um, uh, uh, supporting uh, mechanisms for different levels and layers of, of narratives and stories to, to you know, um, to be heard, really. Thank you. Yes, I think I think there is, as we we've, we've learned uh, over the last few weeks in relation to the um, the uh, the Black Lives Matter expo, uh, uh, em emphasizing our, uh, our history of of slavery and the um, and the uh, reinterpretate or, or reevaluation of the way that we've, that we've um, celebrated that and the people involved in it in the past. It's an interesting way in which, which our heritage 
isn't something that is, is entirely celebratory, but there's an, an, an element of discomfort um, necessary in, in, in acknowledging um, some of the more difficult things that have happened in the past that, inf that, that, that inform the way that we might um, that we might present things in the, in the future. Um, if, if I sorry, Steve, if I can just jump in, I don't disagree with anything that, that has been, been said there, and, and I suppose in some ways both of those points are kind of furthering hopefully what I had in my brain that I maybe didn't articulate well enough. But, so I think the important bit for me is it's, it's heritage not being heritage, not being pigeonholed as heritage, not being seen as if we tick the heritage box, then we've got heritage. It's actually about saying heritage influences our quality of life because it influences who we see ourselves as, or which influences the type of education we go on to do, the type of job we go on to do, and, and that influences the type of place that we are attracted to and live in and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. So the unspooling the bit and the multiple layers and the reason why I agree that we need different scales of funding and different approaches to doing things is that it can't just be heritage organizations doing this stuff. Everyone has to recognize um, and become comfortable with involving people of lots of different backgrounds in telling the stories of place. Uh, and that is how, in my view, it, we're urbanists, I suppose I would argue, and I feel sometimes slightly um, out of like an interloper in, in terms of things, because I don't come at things purely from a physical or bricks and mortar sense. The opera that we produce for me is as much a piece of urbanist work because that is about allowing people to tell a story to influence what happens next in their place and the type of place that their place becomes in the long term, if that also makes sense. <laughs> Yes, it, well, it, yes, it does, and of course, narrative has become a very, a very, uh, a very popular term um, in uh, uh, in recent years. But it does it does depend to a significant extent on whose narrative um, is gaining gaining uh, dominance. Um, and I think that other other, other speakers have um, today have su suggested that we more we need to be more uh, open to alternative uh, narratives. Um, and, um, and and more inclusive of groups and individuals who may not have been heard in the past. And of course, in the, certainly in the field where I work, um, the, uh, the the passion that people have for particular places or particular particular histories can sometimes uh, get in the way of a more of a more inclusive um, consideration of a, of, of a wide range of interests, uh, both physical and and cultural. Um, let's move on a, bit, a little bit to to the uh, to the details of the um, of the of the peace hall in Halifax. There's quite a few comments uh, about the how uh, about the the remarkable landscape that's been created within the uh, within the cloisters of the, um, of the of the peace hall. Um, but how that um, how that works with people with different different abilities um, and how that was incorporated in the in the design, I noted that Angela Rolfe, in particular, was was uh, was keen to know how that had been how that had been tackled. Did you want to en enlarge on that at all, Angela? Angela, still there or talking? No. Well, but it was a it was a point well made, and I'm sure Nick that you will be able yeah. to uh, to, yes. to comment on that. I'd like to. It was a point well made, and I should have made in the uh, in, you know, through the presentation. Yes, it was very heavily consulted on. Was the design of the of the main square, um, and community groups were invo were involved in the decisions. Um, what was most important was reaching the right balance of not having black and yellow stripes all over the place and hazard warnings and such like and the, and the architect the chap Mark Hopton worked to such a high degree of tolerance to make sure that they were just within the law but at the same time we weren't going to have a continual length of accidents um, each week and uh, we do there are some there are some accidents people do fall down the steps but I have to say by and large they they are they're ones where they've not been looking where they're going um, so we have a we have a great because we have a very good security system in there, and again, that that makes adds to this feeling of of comfort in the place. But it uh, it was a very very 
well-researched area and there are areas the, the, there are the gradients are all within the legal uh, levels there are the signage is amazing but mostly it's very very good to find your way around for blind people with um, sight issues it's fine um, and for people in wheelchairs it's excellent so uh, we we get we don't just get away with it we're, we're an exemplar I think and I, I don't want I don't want to put words in your mouth but um, would you say that given that it's a, an enclosed safe quiet place uh, for pedestrians that maybe people look out for each other a little more than they might in a in a you know in, in in the more general environment i think they do and i think what what they there's an over an over an amazing sense of calm comes over one when you go in the in the main gate in whichever gate you go in um and it's this that one of them people mentioned it in the comments i mentioned that they were absolutely you know they breathtaking when they went through the, through the gates to arrive at the place and i think a lot of people do that and they do take a lot more care of where they're going but it's it's just it just works very well and the design is just so sympathetic to the to the challenge of the site so it was a, it was an extremely good job well done but I, we are hugely well they are incredibly aware of of people with disabilities um, but I, I do think it was a it was, a, it was a point well made by, by the commentator, um, but I, I do think uh, we've covered it, to be honest, very um, happily. Thanks. Philip, Philip Jackson uh, raised the point that, uh, that it looks fantastic at the moment, but how is it going to look in 20 or 30 years' time, which I think is a very pertinent point, because, I, the f because I've been to the Peace Hall a couple of times, and there's been a lot of money spent on it um, uh, on at least two, two, two phases of, of, of regeneration. <coughs> in the past uh, and I wonder how you, how how resilient do you think the uh, the new um, repurposing and revisioning of it is going to is going to uh, su survive well I think that the, the answer to that Stephen is the, is the fact that it's now being run by a trust um, the chair is uh, the chief executive is a lady called Nikki Chance Thompson who, who might be well known to people if you ever worked with Jacobs she was one of their uh, one of their consult uh, one of their consultants um, and we've got a very responsible board of board of trustees led by Roger Marsh who's the chair also of the LEP of West Riding and the the emphasis by them is and when when I was working there of cleanliness and of the high standard of maintenance was was very very different from how a local authority looks at things and having spent some time myself working within a local authority as many of you who know that they, how it all works it it's a tight you fix it when you break it when it breaks is this sort of attitude within a, a local authority but now it's moved to within a trust I feel very confident it's going to stay looking super um, for example, when we have a big food event, as soon as they've gone, the chaps are out with, uh, with high pressure water jet hoses to, to clear off the, any residue that's been left behind by food operators. Um, and the cleanliness of the place is paramount. And I think the fact we've got a team of what we call duty managers who look after the place really makes a difference. Um, and I'm sure whilst they can, that will be maintained. So I'm fairly confident it will stay looking as spark sparkling in the future. Okay, and Ezra Watts uh, was asking where the funding came from for that uh, for the project, and I suppose if you could if you could say something about the capital and the and the revenue funding, that would be helpful. Yep, the, the capital funding comes from the from the local council, from Calderdale Council. Um, the funding bodies that also contributed were um, HLF, the Garfield Western Foundation, and the Wolfson Foundation. Um, the local authority continue to help out with bits of funding, but it's within the within the time scale of about another three years, the place should sustain itself. And that was one of the reasons why we opened our own restaurant and conference facility there. That that money, the profit from those two areas, would then be ploughed back into the Peace Hall, the pot of the Peace Hall PLC, if you like. Um, also, we've got a very active uh, foundation who go out and we've got members. You can become a, a member of the Peace Hall. So a lot of a lot of donations come into the building as well. Um, and when we have the big events, those make quite a considerable profit for us. And it, those are needed to to make to keep the wheels on the bus, as you might say. Um, Shane, Shane's presentation uh, focused on the on, on the way in which different um, community interests should be represented through the investments that we make in the, in the promote and the promotion of, of the heritage of, of different places. Um, I, wonder whether, I mean, Halifax is a very diverse city as well. Uh, I wonder how, um, uh, how, how much use is being made 
by diverse groups uh, in, in Halifax? Um, considerable amount of, of activity. And that was why we kicked off that event, the Kindness Festival of two years ago, um, because that we, we very much reached out to the people from different groups, different diverse groups around the town to come and participate in the event. And what, as well as having a, um, we had an Indian uh, food source there from the, as I said, from the, the mosque, we had a Chinese group, we had some people from Malaysia to cooking. So the range of different foods you could get, which had all been donated, um, was absolutely remarkable. It was like something off the TV. It would have, it would have made a great TV program actually. And we did attempt to, to achieve that, but weren't, weren't successful. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, as I mentioned, we even had the army catering call there. So it, we do reach out to all sorts of groups uh, to, to come and use the place and also to be, fe to be featured as far as a retail offer is concerned. Right. Um, and turning, the, turning the question round slightly uh, back to Shane, the, um, we've, we've looked over the last few minutes at the, at, at the distinctive qualities of the Peace Hall, but, but in, your, in your context in Belfast, uh, Shane, you talked about the ways in which we might give people uh, a, greater, uh, a greater say in how we define the culture and heritage of our, of our places. Um, are there any particular uh, locations, spaces, buildings in Belfast that you think are particularly or have proved particularly well suited to um, diverse involvement from all, all sectors of the community? I guess the obvious one that I would point to first up is Conswater Greenway that won the, the Great Place Award um, back in November. Um, and in terms of in a Belfast context, East Belfast having traditionally been seen as, um, uh, well, sorry, if I rewind slightly, actually, Belfast isn't actually that diverse a place um, in that we could benefit from being much more diverse because our conversations and our discussions about, about diversity actually reinforce how alike we are in lots of ways. Um, uh, and the city is traditionally divided into kind of four quarters, um, North Belfast being divided and deprived, South Belfast being divided and wealthy, West Belfast being traditionally Catholic and East Belfast being traditionally Protestant. So going back to your question, Conswater Greenway in East Belfast being traditionally viewed as a very, um, as dominated by one particular side of the community has opened up that access and that story. And I know that the guys over there, uh, I was talking to them last week and we're working on um, together now on a, a new project specifically focused on COVID kind of issues and, and putting heritage and the stories of heritage at the heart of dealing with some of the mental health issues likely coming out of COVID. They're doing lots at the moment at the Greenway around telling the industrial heritage stories of the Greenway that actually tell stories that are connected in lots of different locations across the city. So whilst it's focused on one specific location, in a sense, it makes the connection in a broader sense across the city. But there are lots of others that, uh, I mean, one of the big topics in Northern Ireland is about contested heritage. Um, so there are places like City Hall brings um, in the narrative, you know, being a very loved building in lots of ways, the building that for people defines um, the city in a visual sense. Um, but obviously because of the historic political nature of here has traditionally been viewed as dominated by, connected with one particular political viewpoint. Um, and it's now the process of, well, how does that be rectified uh, in the view of some? And equally, how does that be prevented in the view of others? How does that change be prevented? So I think it, for me, again, it just underlines that point that heritage and culture are not static things, um, that it, it is up to all of us as we move through time to kind of reinterpret them uh, and look at how what the stories connected with all of those are made relevant and actually through all of that going back to my civic understanding and civic heritage point that's where the confidence bit of my argument kind of comes into play that when that happens 
if we understand our places, we understand ourselves better. And if we understand ourselves better, we understand our places better. And that's what makes more confident places. And perhaps if we understand our, ourselves better, we might be uh, a little more understanding of other, uh, of, other, other perspectives and other narratives as well. We can all, we, let's, let's hope we can promote that a little more in the future through the work that the, uh, that the Academy do, uh, does. Uh, this has been, a very, we're almost up to an hour now, and uh, we've really only just got started to get into the, um, the, the challenging aspects of, uh, of, our, of our, historic, uh, our historic settings. Um, and I hope that's, um, that's uh, whetted people's appetite for, for looking into it further. Um, Kevin's su suggested that we might, um, once we've got uh, more freedom of movement, that the Academy might have another visit to, uh, to, to Halifax. The last time I was there was on the uh, assessment visit when Halifax was uh, one of our great town finalists. And, um, and uh, the Peace Hall has come on significantly since then. So I'm, I'm certainly uh, always keen to go back to places like like Halifax. Um, and if any of you uh, present today have suggestions as to other places that, uh, that might uh, contribute to uh, developing our better understanding of the way that, uh, that history contributes to better urbanism, then, then of course you'll feel, you'll feel free to nominate them for, um, for our Great Place Awards in the future. Um, I'm going to draw it to a close there. I'm looking at Steve, and I think, are we more or less out of time? I'd say so, Steve. Good time to wrap up. Okay. Well, um, I, I, that, that's been great. I've, I've got more questions, particularly to ask of Nick about the way in which the uh, the very un unusual structure of the Peace Hall is going to be is going to be used in the future. But maybe we can uh, we can do that on site sometime in the not too not too distant future. You'd be um, very welcome. It's, uh, there's a lot to talk about with it, and, the, and the, the, the interaction of the place with the town has been one of the most exciting things to see happen. Um, and I think that, I mean, I, I, could, I could wax lyrically for ages about some of the things we've done there that, that made the, the historical relevance of the place much more of a, of a, of a game changer for the town. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and Shane, I, I, I think your, your um, promotion of the of, of intelligent Intang intangible heritage as as a really important contribution to our understanding of how cities work uh, and a, an acceptance that uh, it's not just it's not even mere even the, the the professional interpretation it's the popular interpretation of history that we need to pay more attention to if we want people to uh, to, to value it more than they do at the moment so I think with those two uh, lessons um, firmly in our mind. We'll call an end to this session today. Um, I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible at uh, future lunchtime events. They're increasingly popular and successful and one of the ways in which we are uh, getting a, making a positive out of the difficult circumstances that we're in at the moment. But um, I hope all your circumstances get easier uh, over the weeks and months to come and uh, look forward to seeing you in person sometime in the future. Thank you everybody and uh, bye for now. <laughs>